Last time we talked uh, a little bit about turbulence. I was going to do a little discussion on turbulent boundary layers, but um, I'm going to uh, save some of that. I won't go into as much detail, but I'll do a little bit when we talk about CFDs. That'll be more connected there. So we're going to move on to our next section. Uh, we'll start getting into wing theory. So today we'll be mostly conceptual, not too much into the math yet, but uh, looking at some of the changes that we have to make as we move from the 2D world of airfoils to three-dimensional wings and uh, lifting bodies. Okay, so uh, first I just wanna uh, think about conceptually what the drag looks like um, for an airplane as a function of speed. And this would be a good exercise for you to pause and, and to, to pause the video and to try that yourself, try to sketch this. Most commonly, <clears throat> students will sketch something that looks like this or some variation of that, but something that drag increases with speed as, as seen here. Um, this is indeed correct for like say a, a car or a train or something like that, but not for an airplane. Uh, we have this intuition from a car and then that makes sense, right? And it's uh, quadratic as they increase in speed. Now, if you've ever put your hand out of the window of a moving vehicle, you certainly can feel that increased resistance uh, grow pretty quickly with increased speed. Uh, but for an airplane, uh, it actually looks something more like this, where it does have the same kind of uh, quadratic eventually increase uh, um, at high speeds, but the drag also increases at low speeds. So why is that? What is different about an airplane? <clears throat> well, an airplane needs to generate lift, unlike uh, uh, these other vehicles we've been discussing. And the generation of lift itself is associated with drag, a new type of drag that we haven't discussed yet, and that's called induced drag. So um, let's write that induced drag. We'll see this later, but um, if I was to draw the two components, this would be, say, for example, the, uh, oh, that's not good. Let me go negative. Um, maybe I better start over so I can draw this well. Just say it looks something like this. Let's say this is the induced drag. So it's high at low speeds and then it tapers off. And then the other drag is parasitic drag. This is the drag that we're, we're used to. This is um, from the Pressure, I mean, everything is from pressure, but this is kind of that form drag, the shape, and also the skin friction uh, drag that, that we're used to seeing. And so the total drag then, um, let's just pick a different color here. It's gonna be something like this. And uh, I didn't draw that super smooth, but the minimum will be at where those two cross. So <clears throat> this part we understand, this is something we gotta get uh, some understanding on today. Uh, roughly speaking though, why is this drag really high at low speeds? Well, you can imagine that as I'm going really fast and flying at really high speeds, um, actually we'll, we'll come back to that. Let's, let's, uh, let's think about first the mechanism of this. And before we do that, I'm going to introduce a little bit of nomenclature. In aerodynamics, these are some common conventions. We use B for span and span notice is this projected span. So it does not follow the length, path length. So if you've got a vertical winglet, it doesn't increase your span at all. S is used to refer to wing area, uh, capital lambda, wing sweep. Sometimes we define sweep at the leading edge, uh, but often at the quarter cord is perhaps more common. Phi is used to define a dihedral angle. Um, so this is the a side view. So as phi goes to 90, that would be a, again, a vertical winglet. Um, some other commonly used parameters. Uh, are things like aspect ratio. It's an A and an R combined, as you often see that kind of stylized version. It's the span squared over the wing area, or I could think of it this way, span over the average cord, right? Where the area would be span times the average cord. So in other words, it's just a, a uh, uh, tells me a ratio. Well, let me just show you a picture. This would be a high aspect ratio wing versus a low aspect ratio wing, right? It's kind of that ratio of span to an average geometric cord. 
Uh, sometimes you'll see taper ratio. This is maybe not as useful for more complex wings, but for simpler wings, um, it would be the ratio of the cord at the tip of the wing relative to the root. So a typical, um, say, transport airplane will have an aspect ratio of, say, eight or nine or so, uh, taper ratio of around 0 0.2, 0 0.3. A fighter jet is going to have a much lower aspect ratio, maybe three or four or so. Um, so those are just some parameters. Another thing we're going to need or we'll use is what's called the mean aerodynamic cord. So I already mentioned the mean geometric cord, uh, but that one isn't quite as, uh, as widely used as the mean geometric cord. It's defined this way. It is the integral. So if I integrated the cord, and why I should say is this uh, direction along the span. So if I integrate the cord along the span and I integrate from zero to half span and multiply by two, we just integrate over the half span multiply by two because wings are in pretty much every case symmetric. So we just integrate over half, double it. So this here would be the area. So if I divided by the area, I would just have one. So the mean aerodynamic cord is actually uh, chord squared. So if I multiply by another chord, now this has units of chord or units of length. And this is how the mean aerodynamic chord is defined. It is a chord weighted um, average chord. And we use this in aerodynamic calculations. For example, if I was estimating the Reynolds number of the wing, I would typically use the mean aerodynamic chord as my length scale. It's also commonly used in uh, stability and control calculations. So when I have a chord and say my pitching moment coefficient or, uh, um, you know, for example, I, I would use the mean aerodynamic cord in that as well. For a linear ta linearly tapered wing, uh, like that simple wing that we're showing right here in this integral, we can do uh, analytically, and it just looks like this, where this is again, R is the root, T is the tip. Okay, so that's just a bit of nomenclature. Um, let's go back now and start talking about concepts of drag. So we have already learned how to, for example, compute the lift and the pitching moment and, uh, and drag, where drag here is, is my, what we call parasitic drag, it has to do with my form. Uh, the shape as well as the uh, skin friction drag. We've computed these for an airfoil, but now we want to do a wing. And, and a wing is you know, really just a loft between two airfoils. It may have multiple lofts um, and it may actually be curved. It doesn't have to necessarily be a linear loft, uh, but each cross section is an airfoil. So how can we relate what we've done so far with airfoils to the wing? Is it the same? Can I just chop up my wing? into a bunch of airfoils, compute the lift at each one, integrate that to get the total lift, right? Because these are actually lift per unit span, same with drag and pitching moment. Is that sufficient just to break it up into a bunch of airfoils? Turns out, no, it doesn't mean everything that we've done is not useful. It does mean that we have to make some changes to what we've done to make it useful for a wing. Uh, and that is because the flow field for a three-dimensional wing is not the same as a bunch of 2D sections just stacked together. So to motivate that, uh, I, I'm going to have you try to draw another picture. Imagine this airplane here has just flown through the page or the screen here. And so we've got this flat plane. And here, I mean, flat surface, not airplane plane, but it's plane. Airplane has just flown through. And I'd like you to draw the flow field that would exist. So in other words, if I had all these vectors to draw which way the air is going to move. Right now it's not moving, but as soon as the airplane passes through, what would it look like? So I'm going to pause and take a moment and try that. So here's a depiction of what that flow field looks like. Uh, I've got a bunch of downward moving air um, uh, underneath the wing and this kind of circulation that's occurring, air being pulled in towards uh, the top. So why is this happening? Well, one way to describe it is to think about fundamentally what lift means. If we were to describe it very simply, we could say, well, lift simply means that the air is creating a force on the airplane that pushes it up. 
right? I mean, that is where the force is coming from, is from the air. That's the aerodynamic force, generates lift. So by Newton's third law, that means that the airplane or this vehicle must be pushing air down. Uh, that means that I must leave behind some sort of wake because for me to generate lift, air must push me up. That means by contrast, I will, my airplane will be pushing air down. So I'm gonna leave energy behind in a wake. This is uh, what gives rise to this induced drag. If I had no drag, as we've discussed before, I would have perfectly still air fly through and have perfectly still air still. But because air is being pushed down, there's energy left behind, then uh, that means I have uh, created a drag. And notice that this drag, we said nothing about viscosity. This would occur in the viscid world as well. Um, it's simply a consequence of lift. And that's why this plot is different, right? Because I don't have that in the car case. This is all of my drag. But now because of lift, I have this extra component of drag. At high speeds, it's less important. And, and now we can maybe understand this a little better. As I'm flying really quickly, I've got a lot of dynamic pressure, right? One half rho v squared, that pressure that's coming in is very high. So I don't have to push the air down very far in order to generate a lot of lift. But if I'm flying really slow, the dynamic pressure is coming in is very small. In order to get the lift that I need, I've got to push down a lot of air and I've got to push it down um, at pretty high speeds in order to get the lift that I need. So I'm leaving behind a bigger wake. I've got to exert a bigger push on the air. Um, Maybe you could think of it if you've ever done like a water skiing or something that if uh, I'm going really slow, it's hard to stay up, right? Because I'm not, I have to put uh, the, the sort of um, force that exerts that's between me and the water is not enough to keep me up. But if I'm going very fast, right? It's not, uh, doesn't take as much to keep me up on the surface. And that's, that's not a perfect analogy, but uh, similar idea, right? As I'm going really fast, uh, in the air, I don't have to push much down. So this drag, or I don't have to push much air down. So this drag goes down again at low speeds. I need to push a lot of air down very quickly in order to generate the lift I need. That's why this drag goes back up at high speeds. So <clears throat> why this particular shape? Well, we've already discussed that the air must go down. So we can see everywhere in the wing, the air is being pushed down. Um, that's got to come from somewhere. So uh, in this plane, it's coming from above. So I'm essentially in training air from above, pulling it from above and pushing it downward. Um, because air is coming from above, I've got to fill that in somewhere, right? There's not this infinite void I can continue to pull from. So this air uh, kind of fills that void. It circulates back around as seen here, it kind of the circulation. And this is also associated with that same circulation we've seen before for a vortex, it creates lift. In fact, this is one way this is commonly visualized, even though there is a distribution of vorticity here, uh, it's strongest say over here towards the wingtips. And so we see kind of this predominant circulation pattern. Actually, here's a picture of that, um, of a, a smaller airplane flying through, uh, some, uh, what would you call it? Like a, uh, I don't want to call it then like a red dust, right? That, that we can visualize and we can see that swirling behavior of the vortex that's being created here. Um, another way this commonly ex explained, though is somewhat misleading, is that if I'm creating lift, that means I've got a high pressure relative to a lower pressure on the top. And so that means that the air around the tip must move around. It's a little bit misleading because then people will explain winglets by saying, well, it's a tip vortex suppression device, but that's not really the case. We're still gonna have a tip vortex even with a winglet and that's not necessarily its primary function here, right? In fact, we could just increase the span and get similar benefits. And it also doesn't really explain why if I've got a C or a box wing, or if I have no wing tip at all, why I would still have a, a tip vor or a, a vortex, which I still will. I will still have, I say tip vortex, people call it tip vortex. I'll call it tip vortex, but it's not really just a tip phenomenon. It's 
generated by the vorticity on the entire wing, it just happens to typically be strongest at the tip. And so uh, the center of vorticity moves towards an area near the tip. But even if I have a box wing, no tips at all, this vortex pair will still exist. And so this, this is why I say this explanation is a little bit misleading. Uh, it's perhaps more fundamental to think about Newton's law and just to generate lift, that means I must be pushing air downward. And so I'm gonna leave this energy behind and because the air is going down, I need to fill that space and it comes and circulates around. And, and uh, this circulation, as we've seen, is associated with lift uh, with the Kajikowski law. Okay, so there are a lot of great videos uh, that you know, I encourage you to go look some of these up. You can go see on, on, on the internet, lots of good videos of uh, wake vortices from airplanes. Um, here's another picture, uh, kind of a top view. So if I was looking this way on the side, I'd see that vortex. It looks a little bit, you know, kind of like a tornado and you can see these streamlines, uh, you know, from this dye and this fluid kind of spinning around each other, right? And you can see again that they also, um, even though it's being generated across the whole wing, they kind of start to move towards the center of vorticity, which again is stronger towards the tip. So they kind of move towards, we often think of it as a pair of, vor of vortices. That is an approximation, right? That's not really the case. There's a distribution of vorticity here, but it's, it's kind of like a hurricane, right? It's not a point vortex. It's this distributed thing, but um, uh, actually I'm not quite sure if it's exactly like a hurricane. I'm, I'm, I think the hurricane has more of a solid body core rotation in the middle as, as this does as well. But anyway, again, not a perfect analogy, but uh, uh, you can see some of that behavior there. Okay, so we now need a, a mathematical model. Uh, vortex obviously seems to be the right thing to use. We've seen this already in 2D. We can extend the point vortex that we're used to seeing in 3D. So if this was my 2D surface, here's my point vortex. We could imagine that that vortex is actually now a line and the equation would be exactly the same, right? Um, uh, so we had uh, gamma over two pi r for a point vortex. We can now imagine this line vortex, which behaves the same. It's just that I've got circulation that if I was to create a, a cross section at any point here, it would look like a point vortex, but I've now just stretched this out into the line. And so it's inducing velocity, not just at Say this one point in this plane, but you know everywhere in this three-dimensional space. So downward on this side, upward on this side. So that's a building block towards a model I can use in this three-dimensional space. Um, it turns out that the equation for this, I'm, I'm just going to write it. We call this a, a, a vortex filament. For vortex filament, the velocity that's induced by a vortex filament, um, and actually I should back up, we actually know what it is already for this case, it's a scam over two pi r, but I wanna generalize this, right? Maybe I, it doesn't go on forever, maybe it's just a segment, right? It's got endpoints, or maybe it goes to infinity in one direction, but has an endpoint here, or maybe it even curves, right? And I, I've got uh, circulation that's bending or it you know, moves in different shapes like this, uh, we want to be able to compute it for any of these. And we call that a vortex filament. The equation for this is as follows. It's gamma over four pi times the integral. Um, and I won't derive this, but I will say a few things about it. R cubed. So what this is, I've got this filament. It could be whatever, you know, arbitrary shape and size, um, DL. L is just a vector that's following along the direction of uh, my vortex filament. And so DL is just this infinitesimal length, right? So it's kind of varying with the length of this uh, filament. And then R here is just the point of interest. This is some point R. And I want to evaluate the velocity that's induced by this filament at that point, right? So this whole filament, let's just say it looks like that. It's got a little curve, goes like that in three dimensional space. That filament induces some velocity at some point, and I want to, be able to calculate it. This is the expression. This is called the Bio Savart law. Um, it is the exact same <clears throat> expression from electrodynamics, if you've ever taken a course on that. So it's the equation that's used, for example, if I've got a wire with an electric current in it and I want to 
calculate the magnetic field that it induces. In fact, this induction uh, is why uh, this form of drag is called induced drag, just because a lot of the mathematics just directly come from you know, induction and electrodynamics. So there it is, uh, Biot-Savart law, there's the formula. Um, let's now use this formula for a, a simple case, a case that we'll use a lot, which is just a straight line. So, so this will work in general, right? It's the path integral, but let's just do a straight line segment. Um, that way we can, we can do this integral analytically. So I've started to sketch this a little bit. I've got a vortex filament that starts here, ends here. I'm calling this angle here theta, and that's the angle between uh, my vortex filament uh, here in this point of interest. So my evaluation is going to start right here at theta one. It's going to continue to here to theta two. So those are going to be my integration limits. Here is some arbitrary point with some length dl. And I want to integrate along this path. Uh, again, r is the distance to my point of interest. And here I've written this h for convenience. It's just a distance to, or it's the perpendicular distance to, um, uh, uh, to, the, to the point I want to evaluate in this vortex filament. So one of the terms that appear in this equation is dl cross r. So let's just try to evaluate that first. Um, so dl cross r. Well, that's just going to be the magnitude of dl times the magnitude of r. And dl is a vector point this way, r is a vector point this way. So theta is the angle between them. So from the rules of the crossbar act, we could say the magnitude at least, I'm not gonna worry about the sine, but at least the magnitude is dl times r times sine theta. Later we'll worry about the direction, but for now just the magnitude. Okay, well, let's, uh, uh, I'm gonna need some few more expressions here. So let's see, uh, the sine, I can see from the geometry here that the sine of theta is just h over r. So, Oops, sine of theta is equal to h over r. So I can now solve for r. Uh, r is just, I, I, what I'm trying to do here is I'm trying to get my integral just in terms of theta so I can integrate from theta one to theta two, okay? And I've got this r, I wanna, I wanna be able to plug that into here. Uh, h is a constant, so I can get things in terms of theta. Um, I'm also gonna need to, I don't wanna integrate over dl, I wanna integrate over d theta, so I'm gonna try to relate those two. So let's also define the tangent of theta. Tangent of theta is um, h here over this length. So uh, as I've defined it, this is L, this is an arbitrary location. It varies, right? L goes from zero to the end here. And that's what I'm integrating over. Normally I'd integrate from L equals zero to whatever this total length is, but I wanna change my integration to theta. It'll be a little more convenient to this integral. Um, I'm gonna define this distance here as L sub h. It's the distance from the start to this point that's perpendicular. Notice that this is a constant, whereas this is a variable. So that means the tangent of theta is um, h divided by, this distance here is lh minus l. Okay, so in other words, if I rearrange, right, I bring this over and bring that one over and I take the derivatives, I'm just gonna skip the step here. If I take derivatives of both sides, I get that dl is equal to h over sine squared theta d theta. So I'm going to plug that into there and then to there. I'm going to have all my stuff in terms of theta. So if we go back to this Biot-Savart law, right, I see that the magnitude of V, again, I'm not worrying about the sign right now, is gamma over 4 pi, and I'm integrating dl cross r, right, so I've substituted all these things in. I'm going to get an h squared, h squared on the top. Um, I'm going to do a little bit of algebra, so the signs are going to cancel. I've got a sine squared. So let's see, that's gonna give me a h squared over a sine squared. And then uh, in the formula, I've got an r cubed, but I've got an r here, so I'll be left with an r squared. And I have a, uh, let's see. And I guess I still have, oh no, I have the d theta. Yeah, I need to write that term as well. Okay, so um, <clears throat> we can do this integral now. Um, if I do some simplification, right, because I can see that sine of theta is h over r. So if I put that in, sine squared is h squared over r squared. These h squareds cancel. This r squared cancel. Um, I feel like I'm missing. Oh, no, sorry. I made a mistake here. This should still be r cubed, right, because I substituted in here for 
this R already. So there was no R left. This R cubed is left from here. Okay, so now I substitute in sine theta is sine theta squared is h squared over r squared. The h squared is cancel and r squared. Um, uh, actually, yeah, well, let me keep going here. I'm confusing myself. I don't wanna leave the r in there because that's a variable that's gonna change. So I'm actually gonna substitute in for r cubed. r is h over sine theta. So that's gonna give me h cubed over sine cubed theta. So I'm left with uh, all the sines cancel except for one. And then all the R's can, or H's cancel except for one. So I'm gonna pull the H out because it's constant. And I'm left with just this integral here. So I can do that analytically. Apologize, I made that a little bit confusing, but this is what it works out to. Now this is easily integrable. Uh, again, what I was trying to do was substitute everything, you know, get rid of this R because that's a variable that's changing. Once I did in terms of H and theta, theta is what I want to integrate with respect to, H is just a constant. So now I get gamma over four pi H times cosine of theta one minus the cosine of theta two. Now that's my answer for any arbitrary vortex filament. Let's apply it to two cases, one which we already know the answer to, the infinite vortex. We already know that's gamma over two pi R because uh, it's the same as the point vortex in any cross section. But let's try the formula. So I need these angles, right? Theta one or theta two. So theta one is this angle here. And if this is infinitely far away, I can see that theta one is going to zero, whereas theta two is this angle here, uh, this one, right? Yeah, theta two. So theta two is going to pi. So if I plug those in, let's see, I get the cosine of theta one, which is just one, the cosine of pi is minus one. So one minus a minus one is two. So I get gamma over two pi r, right? So V theta is gamma over two pi r, which is what I already knew for a um, infinite vortex. Again, I haven't worried about the sign. I know that based on my sign convention, if I know the direction of let's say gamma is this way. I put my thumb in that direction by the right-hand rule. Uh, at this point here, the circle would be going down into the page, right? So if I was to look this way, if I was putting my eye over here, looking this way, at the side view, it would look like this. I've got a circulation that would be like that, and I'm trying to calculate it at this point, and it would be down, which in our case is into the page. Okay, so the semi-infinite vortex, um, Theta one is the same, goes to zero. Here, theta two is just gonna be pi over two. And the cosine of pi over two is zero. So I just get one minus zero. I get uh, magnitude of the tangential velocity is gamma over four pi r. And that's actually not too surprising, right? If I wanna evaluate my velocity from a semi-infinite vortex, it's exactly half as if I added another semi-infinite vortex to get this infinite one. This is an important result that we'll use a few times that uh, the velocity induced by the semi-infinite vortex is exactly half of that of an infinite vortex. So remember that one. All right, so uh, we now need to add uh, what's called the Helmholtz vortex theorem. This will help us know what type of um, vortex filaments are uh, are consistent for our usage. So let's imagine that I've got this general vortex filament, could be curved or whatever. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna make this control surface, this uh, control volume rather, and the surface is gonna look something like this. It's gonna go around, come over like this, and then there'll be a circle, come around like this way, and then go back. So in other words, um, it would look like I took a piece of paper this and I folded it around the wire. So I've got this wire, this vortex filament that goes around and I'm gonna take this control surface, not control volume, control surface and fold it around the wire. So it doesn't intersect it anywhere, it just folds around. And I'm gonna integrate around the edge, the edges of this control surface. And so in that case, that's going to correspond to going around, uh, around the edge of one circle, straight down the, middle here around the other circle and back. So if I was drawing that, again, our integration path is gonna be like going around the circle, 
going over, and then going around this circle, and then coming back, right? And if I was to unfold this, I'd be like going around the edges of this piece of this piece of paper. So we're going to use Stokes' theorem. Go back to this formula that we have: uh, the curl of the velocity integrated over some area is equal to a line integral of v dot dl. Uh, that's just a path integral. And remember that this is circulation or the negative circulation, depending on which way you define positive. So uh, in my control surface, because it never intersects this wire or this filament, it just goes around it. There is actually no vorticity or no circulation in this control surface. So that's like before when we had an airflow and we said, if we take a control surface that goes around it, then the integral of v dot dl uh, is going to give me gamma. But if I take a control uh, surface around here and I do that path integral, the integral of v dot dl is going to be zero for any shape. If I'm not actually intersecting, you know, these vortices that are being generated uh, in the airflow. In this case, because again, they don't intersect; they're nothing. They're just here in the fluid velocity around the uh, vortex filament, which is all your rotational. And so there is no net circulation. So we know this integral must be zero. All right, so what we can do now is we can divide our path integral into four pieces. Again, I'm going to use those four segments uh, that we mentioned. So let's call this one one, for example, and then we'll come along, we'll call that two, and then come around this way, call that three, and then we'll close it off four. All right, so I've got the integral of v dot dl over one plus the integral over two plus the integral over three plus the same integral over four, and all of that must sum to zero. Well, because we go around this way, we go up two, and then we come back down four, we know that those must cancel because they're exactly the same uh, fluid properties, just going in opposite directions. DL changes sign. So this one must cancel that one. Um, and let's say we were looking now at one, if we were to look at that in 2D, it would be like uh, this vortex filament in the center. Let's say it looks something like this. this is the dot going through it. And here's the direction. My control surface is going around, all the way around like that. So that integral is going to give me, uh, we'll just call that gamma one. Three is going to look exactly the same, except for in one case, let's say I go counterclockwise. When I come back around, I must go clockwise to keep this path continuous. So it's going to have the exact opposite sign. And I could define one as positive or the other negative. It kind of depends the direction you uh, define. It doesn't matter. These are always going to be opposite. And that must equal zero, which tells me that gamma one must equal gamma three. So what that says is, is that along my vortex filament, the vortex strength is constant. In fact, it must be constant. Okay, this is the important takeaway. I cannot create a vortex filament. So this means a few things. I can't create a vortex filament that just ends in the fluid because it went from some vortex strength to zero. And we just said it has to be constant. I can't have a vortex filament that has a certain strength and then suddenly I add a segment next to it that's a bigger strength. I can't do that. I have to create a separate set of filaments. And it's got to uh, either form a closed path because it cannot just end or it has to, well, it can end on a boundary, but it can't end in the fluid, um, or it has to go off to infinity. Okay, so those are the rules uh, of this vortex filament. Um, with that, if we go back to this picture and what we've seen of downwash, we see this sort of tornado or vortex kind of uh, forming near the tip. Um, we know that it can't just end in the fluid, so the first model that we might try with this, uh, these vortex filaments is something like this, right? These are the two, we call them trailing vortices that we kind of saw in that picture. And we know they must go this direction because, right? We're inducing a downwash on the wing. So we know that they must be pushing down towards the center. We also know that we can't just have those vortices or these, these filaments just end. It's got to form a closed path. So we can form this rectangular path that looks something like this. We call this one a bound vortex and this one a starting vortex. And again, the directions we know for two reasons. One, 
because this direction must always be constant, but also they're all pushing down towards the center, right? They're creating a downwash over the wing. We also know because of the vortex theorem that gamma must be constant, they must be that way. So if I look at this trailing vortex, for example, I could curl my fingers in the direction of that trailing vortex. My thumb will point in the direction of the circulation. So that means gamma is going this way. And that must stay not only constant in magnitude, but in that direction. I mean, it's changing direction on the path, but it must continue along that path the same way. So as I come around this way and go like this, gamma must be pointing like that, and then like that, and then like that, right? And so again, to figure out the direction of velocity, you can put your thumb in the direction of gamma. So if we're looking at the starting vortex, for example, gamma would be coming out of the page. My fingers curl in the direction the velocity is being induced, which is as shown in the figure. So here's my first model. It has some good physical backing in that we see these trailing vortices in that picture. Uh, this bound vortex makes sense to induce uh, downward velocity on the wing. And the starting vortex actually makes sense as well, though I won't show it right here. You can see if you look at figures or pictures, you can search online of a, like an airfoil or wing that you just accelerate from rest to start. You'll see this vortex forming called a starting vortex going in the opposite direction of this vortex, which is associated with the lift, right? So if I was to take this airfoil section and look at this bound vortex, that looks a lot like model that we've already had, right? Where I've got this circulation being generated by the wing or an airfoil. So there are a lot of consequences of this. Uh, it will turn out that this model is too simple, but it helps us to understand some basic things, right? That there's downward moving air here. But notice that if I'm over here, for example, this trailing vortex, right, is pushing down inside, but it's coming back up over here. The velocity is coming up on this side. So if I put another airplane over here, meaning downstream and to the side of this wing, I could be in a region of rising air. And that's the idea behind formation flight, right? Is that uh, I've drawn here with airplanes where we probably space them further apart, uh, which is what I did my dissertation work on. But for a, a birds, they'll fly like this, right? Maybe more like in a V formation where you go to the side and to the right and to the left, then I'm in this region of rising air uh, that's effectively like free lift, right? I've got this vertical rising air that's coming up, so I don't have to generate quite as much lift myself, which because I'm not generating as much lift reduces my induced drag. And so I can expend less energy or burn less fuel. Um, so to go back, how do things change? Well, as we've discussed, I can't consider everything as just airfoils like before, just simple airfoils because the velocity field has changed. There's this downward moving air, which we'll usually use the symbol W to indicate downwash, right? And so it may be changing along the wing. So the so everything we've done, we can still kind of use, but we have to consider the downwash. So if we're looking at this 2D, uh, we've used the Kutta-Joukowsky theorem a bunch of times and, and uh, just tells us that the force that I would generate is rho V cross gamma, Right, so it's perpendicular and, and gamma here is, as we've just seen, this is what it's for an airfoil. So V cross gamma gives me a force up using the right hand rule. Put my hand in the direction of V cross down into gamma, which is into the page, my thumb points up. But now I have a bit of a problem in that I have downwash. So things have changed a little bit. I've got this downward moving air. And so my relative velocity is in this direction. So now if I was to apply Kutta-Joukowsky, we would see that perpendicular, if I take V cross gamma now, the force I generate is perpendicular to VR, and it's gonna be in that direction. So I've got a component in the lift direction, but I also have a component in the dr drag direction, and we could call this induced drag. This is again, perhaps a less fundamental way to think of it, but, uh, but it can be helpful to see that things have changed a little bit. The other thing that changes though, is that notice that the relative angle of the velocity coming into my wing has changed. It's, that's not just coming straight in anymore because there's this downward moving air, the velocity has changed. So in other words, my angle of attack has changed. We call this the effective angle of attack. So in other words, if I was to draw this airfoil here, uh, I'm just gonna draw it as if the, the velocity was straight and I'm 
exaggerating here just to make this easier to see. So here's, let me draw better airflow. This is pretty bad. So here's my chord line here. Okay, and so this would be my angle of attack normally. But because V infinity has been uh, directed downwards, then my angle of attack, uh, so this angle here, we would call this the induced angle of attack. It's the same as this angle here. Um, that means, so here's, here's now my relative velocity. You can see it's pointing downward a little bit, right? It's being directed down at an angle like this. So this is VR. So now the effective angle of attack I see is this one, alpha effective. So in other words, the angle of attack at each section is equal to my original angle of attack minus the induced angle of attack. So that's another reason why we can't just use exactly what we've done. We can, but we have to modify the angle of attack for one thing, right? We have to account for the presence of this downwash, calculate what that is. And from the downwash, we can calculate where induced angle of attack is. And from that, we can figure out what our effective angle of attack is. Okay, so I know that's pretty long, but that's uh, I think a good introduction here. One last thing I wanna say, just to introduce where we're going with this, we came up with this model and uh, it's a pretty good starting point, but it's not super realistic. So uh, it's got some limitations. We'll have to improve on it as we will next time. Here's what that model looks like. And actually one thing I didn't say was be helpful. Uh, often we don't draw the starting vortex. We just draw the rest because we consider this as very far away, infinitely far away. It's still effectively there, but it's infinitely far away. So we just draw this part and we call it a horseshoe vortex because it's got this horseshoe shape. So if I use that horseshoe vortex assumption, this is what the downwash looks like behind the wing. You'll notice that it's very large towards the tips uh, and kind of tapers off, but that's not realistic. In a realistic wing, it's actually um, not very strong at the tip. So, so this model is a bit too limited, uh, but we'll, we'll try to improve upon it next time. It's, it's a good start though.